Today's guest on a Life and a Living podcast is Sherry Malouf. Now, Sherry is the chair and principal of an organization called Situation Management Systems, Inc. And their area of focus is on influence and its importance in the business world. She's also the author of the book that we will be talking about, which is The Science and the Leader-Follower Relationship. And it's a fantastic book. We really, really dig into it. And there's so much that we talk about that I found just a fascinating conversation for anybody who is fascinated as I am about leadership, but also about that kind of leader, leader follow, follower relationship. And she does talk about the building blocks of that, you know, that really can make that into a healthy relationship. But we also talk about, you know, the moments and actually identifying the moments of pure potential in that, in that relationship. And she also talks about really the importance that you have in terms of growing that relationship between the leader and the follower and understanding the space that exists between. So I really do encourage you. It's a fascinating uh, discussion. The book is, I highly recommend it. I really do recommend it. It's a really, really good, good book. It's got, you know, based on so much research and, and it really is a helpful book to anybody who is operating in the space of leadership. So I encourage you to sh sit back and uh, relax and enjoy the conversation with Sherry Malouf. Sherry, thank you so much indeed for joining us today on A Life and a Living. It's a real honor to have you here. It's such a delight to be with you, John. I love, uh, you know, my history and my connections with Great Britain and, and uh, of course, Ireland. And so uh, thank you. Not at all. It's a real pleasure. I mean, just to give some context, you're you're the the chair and principal of Situation Management, uh, Situation, Situation Management Systems, Inc., your focus, which we'll talk about, because I want to come on to the, the book that you're is on influence and it's important in the business. And, and also, so people know, I mean, your clients are, I mean, wonderful Fortune 50 clients, but you also kind of operate in kind of midsize and nonprofit. Um, but you're the author of the, the Science and the Leader Follower Relationship, which I have here. And as you can see, it's well thumbed because you were very kindly sent me the PDF. So I have read it. It's a fascinating book, I'd have to say. I really do find it, I do find it fascinating. And one of the things that I, I was really interested in is that you know, for an awful lot of books about leadership, they, 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 they focus on, on the leader themselves. But you're much more fascinated about that relationship between the leader and the follower and that space between between the two. Just curious, kind of what brought you to that space? Because that's very that's a very different angle to take than most books on leadership, if you don't mind me saying so. Well, you know, so it all was came out of my PhD and my thesis. So the paths that I went were not straight as you can imagine. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that I went um, when I was thinking about what I was gonna focus on because initially it was gonna be influence. But one of the things that always fascinated me was about people who can, uh, in very devastating situations, stay centered, grounded, make choices, help people and make things happen. And so I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, and so I really started looking into leadership and that kind of thing. and it came to me as I was looking at it is if you go into all of the historical uh, models, you know, some of the, the basics from a hundred or more years ago, they all talk about task and relationship or task and people, you know, you got to get stuff done and you got to get it done through people. And I thought, well, does anybody look at the relationship? And there's very little that focuses very much just on, what is that relationship? How does it impact things? And how do you look at it? I mean, it's interesting because you talk about that relationship and you talk about the, the kind of the building blocks of that, that, that healthy leader follower relationship, which you call the, the implicit social elements. And there being, you know, trust, fairness, self-control, empathy, status, mutual recognition, respect, and reciprocity. And, you know, and some of those, you know, I, I, to me were kind of, yes, okay, I get that. But I thought some of the interesting ones, I just wanted to pursue it a little bit more um, and dig into it. You talk about 
in fact, the three that I really would like to just kind of dig into a little bit is the self-control, status and reciprocity. Maybe mm -hmm. talk with the self-control and what you actually mean that in the context of that relationship. So one of the things uh, that came clearly through in the research, especially if you're looking at the brain science, is the fact that if people have more self-control, they're more successful, they're more trusted, um, and people will want to have a closer relationship with them. So self-control is really the, it's, it's part of the human experience. You know, we, we're social and we underestimate the amount that we're actually programmed to really participate as a social creature. And we don't look at that stuff and how it impacts us every day. So if you've got, a, a, say you've got a leader that comes in and uh, it's the personality of the day, like, is he going to be, you know, sort of a friendly, good, the good guy, or we're going to, are we going to get the, you know, the really cranky pissed <laughs> off guy, you know? So it's, it's that reliability of who am I going to deal with? Who do I see every day? So there's, but there's all kinds of self-control. There's cognitive self-control, there's um, physical self-control, there's emotional self-control. So self-control is kind of a big category when you think about human behavior. Okay, and the status side of it? Ah, am I valued by the organization? You know, it, it, it's kind of interesting because in my research, the company that I worked with, they were in the process of laying people off. And it hadn't been announced. And, you know, the people that were, you know, going to be gone didn't know it yet. But rumors, you know, they get around and people actually know this stuff, right? So um, what came through as the two most um, uh, uh, statistically related to their score about the relationship was trust and status. And so trust is obvious, you know, am I going to get laid off? Mm. And then status is how important to, am I to the organization? So it's kind of interesting how that, that came out, but status is about respect. It's about prestige. It's about, um, you know, am I uh, part of a respected group in the organization? And at the reciprocity side of it? Reciprocity is, is the basics of all uh, employer-employee relationships. It's what's the exchange. So this is, reciprocity is about what am I doing for you in exchange for my salary? I mean, that's one level of it. But then there's reciprocity in relationships too. Do I support you? Do you support me? So there's a bunch of different levels of um, how reciprocity plays a role. Um, because again, if I am constantly doing things for you, but I never get anything back, and it's not that I'm keeping score, but it's just, again, it's a very critical part of most social structures is that there's an exchange that happens. And when you're looking at that, and you know, tied into that, just what's going through my mind when you were saying that, is the need that we have to be part of something, you know, some kind of vision or mission or purpose, right? And, and particularly around purpose. Is that, is that the ability of the leader to connect my, if you like, who I am and what I am to the purpose of the organization? Because we do talk a lot about, you know, in, when you look at retention of people, that it's about, you know, are they engaged with the organization? Are they engaged with the purpose of the organization? And is that a critical element in that mix? So, you know, where all that stuff comes to, John, is do you and I have common ground? And this is where it gets into the influence piece and how that really um, plays a role in this. So if you and I have common ground around that, right? So if, if, if you have got this mission and our relationship is strong enough that you and I actually agree on the basis of that mission. So if we're connected, because common ground is an energetic, um, you can feel it when you really have that connection with somebody else. I mean, think about the times when you have actually felt that common ground in a really, really strong way. Um, it changes things for people. It changes how they view things. It changes what they buy into because we have a closeness that's there. Mm -hmm. But isn't that interesting as well? Because you're talking about the relationship and you're talking about that kind of the, what can be a transactional uh, element of the, of the relationship, whereas you know, you're my boss and I turn up and you pay me, right? And that's the, the transactional re relationship. Yeah. But then there is that, that other part, which is the engagement, the common ground. But if we're not 
able to find that common ground. Yeah. Is it true then, no matter how good or talented I am and how good you know you are, we're just there's just not going to be a fit between us? It's hard. It's hard when there isn't a connection place. And that's so one of the things that I talk about is that, you know, getting hired by a company is kind of like this forced social relationship because I wouldn't necessarily choose you to be, you know, somebody that I spend a majority of my life with <laughs> if I didn't have this job. Right. You know, yeah. Now I have this job and I have all these people that I'm not really quote unquote choosing to be in my life, but yet I need to have very close relationships with them. And some of those people are weirdos. You know, we're all a weirdo to somebody. <laughs> it's bottom line, right? And so I have to connect with the weirdos. I have to connect with the fanatics. I have to connect with the really shy, introverted people. There's all kinds of people that I have to connect with in order to get work done. So it's everything that happens in an organization happens because of the relationships. And th those relationships, a lot of times are driven by the company culture. So when you talk about engagement, what I'm saying is that engagement is driven by the quality of those relationships. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I, I was having a conversation, in fact, earlier today about in about a, a particular individual in a in a particular team, and the conversation was, do they fit? Mm. Right. It's not about their skill set or their knowledge or their expertise or any of that, but you know the the team creates its own personality and has its own DNA, right? And and it's a question, well, then does that person fit? And and that's kind of that very hard thing to well. I think it's probably impossible to get on in an interview, right? We only would get them when they when they get in there, but because everyone's on their best behavior in the interview. But when you actually when there isn't that fit, there's really only one way that's going to go, isn't it? That you just got to separate and go your separate ways. Well, you know, it's like Jim Collins and his whole thing about getting the right people on the bus, right? I mean, it's. Um, it, I guess part of it is, is where is the lack of fit coming from? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you can really have an in-depth conversation um, and really try to uncover where is the misfit here, what's going on, then you have the opportunity to look past. See, see part of the problem is, is that we have these automatic processes in our brains which say this person fits and this person doesn't fit. And we don't take the time to say, okay, stop. Is that true or not? Mm. You know, I'm making assumptions here. And, and everybody does this very quickly because our, our brain actually is very good at being efficient. Um, so we've got to just figure out very quickly, is this person worth it or not? Yeah. But if the person has got a lot of things that are right, then it's worth investing the time to say, where's the misfit coming from? Can I move on to, in, in, in the book, you talk about the, the evolutionary model of knowledge. And uh -huh. if I can quote, quote you on there, you said, which helps us to understand why we create systems, how we make sense of our experience and how we create meaning from our interactions. Can you elaborate on that? I found yeah. that a really interesting, interesting <laughs> sentence. <laughs> well, you know, the, I love the, the first level, which is there's always potential. And by the way, behind all of this is quant <laughs> theoretical quantum physics, <laughs> which um, I've had arguments with people about as to whether um, Pierce really uh, was making a connection there or whether Bohm was or any of these people. But um, for me, there's always potential in every moment. Okay, so there's potential for anything to happen. And that means we can construct anything like you and I having this conversation. It's getting created because of who you and I are and what we want to make happen in this moment, what we want to talk about, where we want to go. So everything is, has potential in every moment. But this is an unconscious thing. This isn't something that's, that's there. Um, and then we have an experience. And before the brain kicks in and judge, judges that experience, it's just whatever that feeling is in that moment. And so you can't label it because the minute you label it, you're on to the next level. So level two is just that experience in the moment. And then level three is where we make sense of things. We take a look at what's happening, what the potential is, what we experienced and how do we want to make sense of it. 
So at level three, we create all kinds of systems. We take care, create biological systems. Our brains are actually created. I know it sounds crazy, but as we grow and evolve, you know, as we mature, it's experiences that create the connections in our brain. So you can have a biological response to experience. And so there's all this wild stuff, right? Because people are just like, oh, that doesn't really happen. But I like it because it's the mystery and it's the, the oh my gosh, what's that? Um, and then the next level is intention. Now, intention, a lot of people are unconscious about what they want and what they need in a moment. You know, so... So we've got these structures that make sense. And then we go, well, wait a minute. What I experienced really wasn't tied in with my, what my intention is. So I'm going to shift and really get conscious and choose what I want to create in this next moment. Okay. And then the next level is the interaction. So the fifth level is what you and I are doing right now. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of, of kind of making sense of, um, this, this beautiful reality that we're in with all its craziness and its chaos and saying, what is it? If I, if I really believe that there's potential in any moment, then how do I go up through those levels and then create the interactions that I want to have? I, I, I think that's fascinating. And I think that, you know, when, you, when you're talking at the level one, but the every moment has, has you know, pure potential. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, it's a very simple thing to say. But actually, it's an immensely powerful concept because when you're looking, I mean, I if I take that back to the kind of the day to day, you know, managing and leading people, right, is actually recognizing that each moment, even no matter how either mundane or challenging or confrontational or whatever it might be, that it has that pure potential. And that does reframe it, doesn't it? You know, in terms of how you approach it. It challenges you to be conscious. Yes. You know, we've got all this stuff about mindfulness and all this kind of thing. And it's like, well, how do you be mindful? Well, there's potential in every moment to construct whatever quality of interaction you want to have. Yeah. Can I move on, Sherry, to something else that I, that I, I was really interested in? When you talk about that the, the leader and the follower have set, you know, models and expectations of the other. Right? <laughs> yep. Now, that's fine to say that, but if those set models and expectations are not helping how do you shift them and how do you get them? because you know i love i love an expectation i've got a model in my own mind i've made up my mind this is how you are this is what you're going to behave like so therefore that influence is what i do but in order for us to progress i've actually got to you know staying with those set models and expectations is not going to help us move forward if if we need to move forward yeah i mean it, they they really do get in the way and that's, that's one of the big challenges is, is can you see what you're unconsciously doing? You know, everybody has them. Everybody has these different idealized models of what they're, you know, they're the most wonderful soulmate kind of person in the world is going to be to them. You know, we've got all of these expectations that are out there. And what happens? Well, when you have those kinds of expectations, you block some people, you let other people in. And then you're in an echo chamber because you mm -hmm. just are keeping in uh, people involved with you who reflect what you believe about the world. So how do you how do you shift? Because you've got to make a change in your own approach and your own way of thinking. How do you make that shift? Mm -hmm. Because if, if I'm in the echo chamber, the echo is always like is the echo is always right. Right. And it's, it's feeding what I believe. So how do I shift in order to grow? Well, you know, this year, I think, has been a bumper year for people <laughs> to bump into <laughs> That's for sure. all their stuff. Yeah. I mean, everything that we have has just been amplified. All of our, you know, if we have difficult relationships, it's been really easy to avoid those people this year. Mm. Um so what happens is you start being less effective and it's it, for me what i've experienced with myself and other people is we don't change until we bump into pain until we're not getting what we need and so then you challenge yourself and you go okay i've got this one direct report the person i hired them because they have amazing potential they're um really good at what they do 
but gosh, I can't connect with that person. So why? Look to yourself first. What am I doing to stop myself from connecting with this person? So it's, to me, it's, we're so focused on blaming everybody out here. You know, we've got this us versus them going thing going on all the time. And especially with leaders and followers, you know, we're an us or a them. And so, um, you know, it's to step back and go, what am I doing? What am I bringing to the party? Because, you know, one of the things I say, and I say this all the time, is it's 50-50. You know, whatever relation, whatever is going on in a relationship is 50% my responsibility and 50% yours. And if that's how I believe and if that's how I'm looking at it, then I've got to see what am I bringing to the party. And what do I need to do to make it work? Can, can I just touch on, uh, and I, I'm conscious of our time, but I just was really interested. You talked about that, you know, that empathy being the pinnacle of our social cognitive achievements. Yeah. And I mean, and nobody's going to say empathy is not a good idea because it's a bit like <laughs> voting against motherhood and apple pie. But can you really, really explain what that means? And also for many people, just is this, a second question to that is that, as I said, everyone agrees with empathy, but how do you develop and grow your own sense of empathy? So the reason it's, um, it's such a difficult skill is because we are actually wired to take care of ourselves. Mm. Uh, and, you know, we've got the survival of the fittest. We've got all this stuff in us on a biological level and, and, and as part of our development, part of our brain that says, I just have to take care of me. And so the ability to, and obviously a lot of us manage that and put that aside and we, we go on our way and it's more important for us to be part of a social system. So the ability to set my needs aside, not only listen to you, but absorb everything that you're saying and feeling and truly feel it, truly make a connection with you so that you're sitting there going, wow, I feel heard, I feel understood. And so empathy is, I mean, listening is one step of it and it involves intuition, it involves skills like uh, listening, uh, it involves a lot of different pieces and, and, and a lot of self-control in terms of not wanting to jump in and correct you or change you or fix you. Okay, so it's, it's a very challenging thing to develop and really have as a part of a skill. Um, and, and then part of it is, is um, that ability to see into you, see what's going on for you, um, be able to understand, even if it's very different from me, that you have these issues or whatever it is, um, and not judge you. Because mm -hmm. the minute I judge you, I'm creating separation between us. And you can feel it. Yeah. Okay, because the energy is there, you know, and, mm. and so all of this is about managing the space between us. I think, that, you know, it's, it's so, I mean, I, what I just found, because as somebody who operates in, in the, I've been coach leaders, I coach teams, and, uh, and, and I, I just found the book just fascinating, because you were talking about, you know, all of the stuff that, that, that I work in, and, and operate in, but also, I found that it was really helpful in terms of understanding that, if you like, that that space between the leader and the follower and that that's where the influence happens. Right. And and I think that for, for leaders to really grasp that, I think, is 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 it would is a real breakthrough for people to understand that that's actually the space where the influence uh, influence happens. So Sherry, I, I found it, I mean, I would highly recommend the book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it's it's a great read. We have scratched the surface of it in the conversation today because we could go on for hours. But I, I really want to thank you for writing it because I actually found it very helpful uh, in my own profession, but I would highly recommend it to, to, to other people. And um, yeah, I'm sure this is, uh, th there's a heck of a amount of research that went into it as well, isn't there? Yeah, it's nothing compared to what my chapter two of my dissertation looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry, before we wrap up and ask you where people can get the book and where they can get in touch with you, two questions that I ask uh, guests on the show is a book other than your own uh, that, you, that you've read that, that has had a, an impact upon you. So what's the book and what was the impact? Um, I think I mentioned it's a series of books and they're kind of fantastical. 
uh, but it's the teachings of the masters of the Far East. And I read them, I read that series of books. It's a series of five books. They were written in the 40s. Um, and uh, the impact on me was to remember there's a lot of magic in life. What's, and, the, what's the name of it again? That's not a boy. That's, that's not a series I've come across before. That's interesting. Called The Teachings of the Masters of the Far East. Oh, wow. I mean, that's, that sounds fascinating. And, and I read it very young. I was like 15. So All right. Like okay. <laughs> that fantastic. And secondly, I'm always fascinated by um, successful people's daily rituals. So I'm just curious as to what are yours and what, how they help you navigate your day. Well, um, I have a lot of animals. So I have goats and geese. Um, so they require feeding in the morning. I have 400 gallons of saltwater tanks. I have freshwater tanks. I have parrots. I have dogs. So part of my ritual every day is that I'm in service to all these beautiful, amazing animals that are a part of my life. And that's how I look at it. I feed them, uh, do whatever they need, run around outside with them. You know, so that's, that's a real part of every day at the beginning and the end of every day um, is a part of what I do. And I do see myself as in service to all these, these, uh, th my gang, so to speak. But I also do, uh, I do DDP yoga. Um, and uh, I, I really like doing that. I even got a, uh, a picture of myself with uh, Diamond Daniel Page. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, so I, I do work. Um, there's a lot of self-care in every day. Um, that has to happen. Oh, that's fantastic. Sherry, I really want to thank you for being a guest today. Where can people get in touch with you? The book is being published when again? Just remind us again when the book so is being published. On, uh, it's available on February 24th. If you Google okay. it, you can uh, find it on Amazon. You can pre-order the ebook, and then um, you can't do pre-order on paperbacks for some reason. No. So the paperback will be there on the 24th as well. Okay, well, listen, we will have all of that I wish you great success with the book. I've no doubt you will have it, but it's been fantastic to have you on the show and we'd love to come back and talk about it a bit more. Uh, I'm always available for you, John. I've really enjoyed meeting you and thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure. It's been fantastic. Thanks, Sherry. <laughs>